Gary, you're very welcome to the ScaleX Insider podcast. I'm really thrilled to have you on the show today. Hey, g'day, Brendan. It's really just a delight to be with you and with an Irish mate. <laughs> indeed, yeah. We had a little chat about that offline. So uh, kindred spirits, indeed. I had shared with you previously, and you know a little bit about our work at this stage, our vision is to inspire, connect, and enable millions of ambitious leaders of small and medium-sized enterprises to scale with purpose. So I always kick off the show with this question. What does scaling with purpose mean to you, Gary? Well, I, I think scaling with purpose really comes down to the two things that you need to be successful in business. And unfortunately, I've observed a lot of leaders forget one of them, and that's building the will of the people. There are two things in business you need. You need the will of the people and you need a good strategy. And most good business people can put together a really you know, sensible strategy. But if you've got a low will of the people, in other words, people don't go to work every day, are making a, a contribution to something bigger than themselves. They don't learn something new. They're not protected by and set free by a compelling set of values. And more importantly, they don't go home happy then you have a low will of the people. So scaling to me is not just strategy. It's very linked to the most important, the most important thing in any business, which is people. You know, Aristotle, who was born in 384 BC, said pleasure in the job puts perfection in the work. Our job as leaders is to bring that pleasure to the job. And as my dear friend Ken Blanchard says, that doesn't mean the prisoners are running the prison. It, there's a whole lot that goes into that. So that, sorry, was probably a longer answer than you would needed, but I, 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 that's how I feel about it. No, I love that. And uh, there's, there's a lot in that which we'll unpack as we go along. If you could share with the listeners the scale of WD-40 now, because everybody will be familiar with WD-40, but I just want to get a sense in terms of the, and my background's finance, so apologies for, for leaning on metrics here, but since you came into the role as CEO, you know, what's the scale of the company now? Where has it come from in terms of people, revenue, territories, uh, mm -hmm. market cap, and just to give us a sense of that. Sure, Gary. sure. So when I was um, gifted the privilege to lead the company back in um, 1997, we were about 100 million US dollars in revenue. Uh, about 80% of our revenue was in the United States and our market cap was about 300 million. Uh, today, uh, we're um, north of 500 million in revenue. Uh, we market our product in 176 countries around the world. Um, we have about 600 tribe members across the world, uh, and our market cap has gone from 300 million to just over $3 billion. So it's a compounded annual growth rate of total shareholder return of about 15 plus percent a year. We have a return on invested capital of 35%, and we have employee engagement at 93%. Wow. Congratulations, That's, uh, those, those statistics are, are phenomenal. Now, let's, uh, let's unpack some of that. What would you say, and we'll dig into this further, but what would you say are kind of three of the underpinning components of your 10 x success in market cap, let's say? Number one, it's the culture. Culture is a competitive advantage. When I was given the privilege to lead back in 1997, I looked around and I said, how am I going to do this? You know, if we're going to take the blue and yellow can with the little red top to the world, micromanagement is not scalable. So we have to find a way to do it. And I poked around and I found a, a, a course at the University of San Diego. It's a Master of Science in Executive Leadership. And that's and my one of my professors there was Dr. Ken Blanchard. He wrote the One Minute Manager and I don't know how many other books. And uh, in fact, Ken and I became really good friends. And today it's Wednesday when we're recording. This afternoon I play nine holes of golf with with Ken, Dr. Ken Blanchard. He's eighty two years old now, wow. but he introduced me to the concept of servant leadership, and it really was appealing. And it's interesting at the same time, Brendan, I read something of the Dalai Lamas, which was 
Our purpose in life is to make people happy. If we can't make them happy, at least don't hurt them. And what I saw around me, not necessarily within the company totally, but around me was leadership where ego was eating empathy instead of empathy eating ego. And they were hurting people through greed and short-term thinking. And I said, that's not going to work. So number one, we started to build a great culture. Number two, no doubt, we have a fabulous product. Uh, the, the core product, WD-40, um, you know, it was invented in 1953 to stop corrosion in the umbilical cord of the Atlas space rocket. It's an honest product. It does what it says it's going to do. And it's core to, you know, our why statement. Why do we get up every day? And people ask me, why do you get up every day? And, you know, the, the answer they expect is to stop squeaks. Well, that's not it. We're in the memories business. So the second thing about this was creating a culture where we get up every day to solve problems and create positive lasting memories. And then the third thing about it was we saw the opportunity. We had a dream and we thought that dream was uh, achievable, which was to take the blue and yellow can with a little red top to the world. So um, people, strategy and dreams um, probably were the three things that um, started us on that journey. Yeah, I, I've noted here, as you said, people, strategy and dreams, you know, I put this in, in, in a line with our 10 principle model, you know, a positive growth culture, number one, which is our 10th principle, purpose and vision, which is our second principle and kind of the, the, you're in the memories business. I mean, uh, people wouldn't necessarily, if they were challenged with the purpose of WD-40, say, yeah, it's, it, it's a company that's in the memories business. So that's really interesting. At what point do you feel in your journey as a CEO, did you sense that purpose was really important? Because I sense out there at the moment, there's, there's a lot of compulsion and companies to feel the need to, to find a purpose, but there's also a lot of purpose washing. So what was that mm. journey for you like, uh, Gary, in terms of what, you know, was it, was it a dada moment or was it a general unveiling as you kind of grew in the CEO role? You know, I think early on, and, and again, as I went through this program that I did at USD and eventually got my master's in leadership, the, the concept of purpose on anything became a lot clearer to me. What, why do we exist? What's our purpose in life? You know, um, and, and as we started to talk about it within the company, and I used to say, you know, we get up every day to create a positive lasting memory and there's nothing better than a positive lasting memory. You know, at the end of the day, the only thing we'll have left is our memories. And it was interesting because that aligned with the product. You know, I, often I would say to some or someone would ask me, you know, what do I do? And I say, I, I work for WD-40. And the first words that came out of their mouth was, I remember when. I remember when I was working with my grandpa on a car. I remember when it solved my problem. I remember when. I remember when. And it was like, okay, if the purposes, and then that aligned beautifully with a purpose of creating positive lasting memories for the people in our organization. So I think initially I didn't realize it, but as we got deeper into it, it became very clear that I prefer to get up every day and say, my pur our purpose is to create positive lasting memories than to say, our purpose is to stop a squeak because anybody can stop a squeak. I can do it with olive oil. Yeah, I, I love that. And I'm, I'm, and as we're speaking, I went to my phone because on Monday at our, at our morning meeting, uh, we always share an insight from some of the material that we're reading. And at the moment, we're reading your wonderful little book, Tribe Culture and How It Shaped WD-40 Company. And our program manager shared with me, uh, her father sadly passed away, uh, over a year and a half ago and she uh, bought the book and she sent me a note and with a picture of the can saying staple item for the council as it is the solution to a lot of things in this house thanks to my dad educating us on how to, to do DIY so you might not have realized it but your introduction of the book on Monday brought a smile and a laugh to my face so beautiful and that's straight from <laughs> straight from my phone uh, so you know to connect this can which everybody will associate with with a with a purpose 
around compelling memories. Is, Very important. Yeah, uh, uh, but incredibly clever. And in terms of purpose then, how have you found that purpose has led to attracting and retaining your staff? And I know you refer to them as tribe and we've come to that. I mean, you referred at the outset a 93% retention rate, uh, which is incredible when you think there's a lot out there talking about the great resignation and the war on talent. And there you guys are uh, selling a lubricant and have a 93% retention rate. So, where does purpose fit into that, do you believe, Gary? A lot. And, you know, you talk about the great resignation. I've renamed it. I call it the great escape. People are escaping from toxic cultures. There is no doubt about it. And our employee engagement rate, that 93% is engagement, not retention. So that means that people are actually, the, the national average of engagement right now that was measured from an ADP uh, research of 1,900 companies was 16% during COVID. So 84% of, of people who went to work every day were disengaged, or what I call quitting and sticking. But getting back to the core of your question, I think the two things that really attract people to our company. Number one is, imagine a place where you go to work every day, you make a contribution to something bigger than yourself, you learn something new, you're protected, and set free by a compelling set of values. Now I'm gonna stop there because it's the values in the organization that are our, our, what I call the banks of our river. And if you think about a river, it goes from the mountains to the sea and the bank of the banks of the river keep it flowing to the sea. But along that river, it's just like being in a business. There's rapids, you know, there's gonna be times of turmoil. There's gonna be times of peace where you might pull off on the bank and have a rest. But if it wasn't for those banks, that water would end up being a cesspool. So it's our values in our organization that are so important. If you go onto our, our careers page, the first thing that pops up is these are our values. This is what we stand for. We are a tribe of people who come together to protect and feed each other. If this appeals to you, call us. If it doesn't appeal to you, don't bother calling us because you, you, you won't like it here. Not everybody wants to be in a culture like ours where you care about your people, you're candid with your people, you hold them accountable, and you expect them to be responsible. People, some people don't want to be there, but a lot of people want to be with us there. Yeah, I love that. And I want to just dive in a little bit to the the embedment of your values in terms of how you live those out on a daily basis because what I'm challenged with uh, certainly with the the CEOs that uh, that I'm dealing with on a regular basis is the the challenge of taking the values which are on the website or on the, the company wall and how they how they're lived out in practice and how they should be illuminated and 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 certainly made made the daily practice, made the norm. What do you guys do to kind of live the values? In 2009, I was fortunate enough to co-author a book with Ken Blanchard, The One Minute Manager. And it's called Helping People Win at Work, a business philosophy called, I'm not here to mark your paper, I'm here to help you get an A. And in that book, we described how we actually include our values in our ongoing talent development conversation. So every, every 90 days at least, we ask our tribe members in a formal way, because we have a formal informal conversation with them as their coach, to describe how they've lived our values in the last 90 days. And we only have two measurements of values. You either live them or you visit them. And we don't want a lot of visitors. So it's not unusual. Our first value is we value doing the right thing. And a tribe member will write, here's how I lived that value, an, an absolute example. Or the second value is I value creating positive lasting memories in all my relationships. Here's how I did that in the last 90 days. So since 2009, we've been encouraging people to embed this behavior and then to be proud of it. Uh, and many times we have... Um, you know, town hall meetings and, and, and group gatherings and, you know, 
brown bag lunches and we ask people to talk about it. Hey, how did our values help you in, in, in making a decision and describe that to us? And I, if I may, can I give you a little example of, of how a value can work? Please. Okay. So our second value is we value creating positive lasting memories in all of our relationships. And if it, that, that value has a paragraph written underneath it that, that actually describes what that means, because we seeing we operate in so many countries, the definition has to be clear because that could be interpreted in a lot of different ways. But some time back, I was uh, in a meeting in our, what we call our, our teepee, which is because we're a tribe, we call our building the teepee. Um, and uh, it was early one morning and I was in a meeting with a bunch of uh, our, our coaches. And, and there was one person in the room that morning that absolutely, Brendan, was not creating a positive lasting memory. They were having a really cruddy morning and you could feel the negative toxin just swelling in the room you know the atmosphere was flat the oxygen was getting sucked out you know everybody was it was on people's faces you saw just get me out of here I don't want to be here so what do you do as a leader in that situation option a you stop the meeting and reprimand the person eh, not a good idea option b you do nothing eh, not a good idea Option C, bring the values into play. So when the meeting was over, we're walking out of the meeting room and I said to this person, I'll call him Brendan just for, for the sake of it. Hey, Brendan, let's go for a walk. So we walked out of our building and I started to look in a trash can and I looked under a car and I'm looking behind a bush. And Brendan says to me, what the hell are you doing? I said, Brendan, the you I know and love was not in that room today. What's on your mind? What's getting in your way? Can we talk? So we started to have a conversation. And yeah, Brendan had had a crappy morning. He had a bit of an altercation with his wife, partner, or significant other. Uh, you know, that set him off on the wrong foot. You know, coming to the office, he got flicked off a couple of times. He was late because he got caught in it. The whole morning went sour for it. And we talked about how that wasn't living one of our values. Sure, that happened to you, but you... If you once you enter our, our our tribe, you have to live the value. You can't bring that with you. The best thing you could have done is not come to work today. Is gone to the beach and you would have been fine. And at the end of it, by using our values as the trigger to enter the conversation, we hugged. He went back into the office and I saw him go to a couple of people that were at the meeting and apologize. And here's the here's the rub that I really love about how we care for each other. The next day, I observed people going to him in the morning and saying, you okay today? Is there anything I can do to help you? So if you take your values and you actually put them into action, that's the sort of, and, and that was a beautiful outcome. There was a learning, as you probably know, we don't make mistakes. We have learning moments. And there was a learning moment for him and a little coaching that we were able to do. But the outcome was absolutely fantastic. Yeah, I love that. And there's a number of things I want to pick up on. You've said it a number of times. You've referenced the tribe. You also used the term coach. And I want to come to learning moment as well. So I'm going to come back to those because there's quite a lot in it. Being one of them. And I always say, you know, as CEO, I, I perceive the CEO as chief energy officer. And what you've alluded to is, you know, your vibe attracts your tribe. And what you're, what you're preserving there is the culture in terms of being a, using, using the values to be a custodian of your culture. You detected that something was disrupting the vibe and the values give you the, the guidelines to address that so that somebody could um, rebalance themselves, let's say, or address the vibe that they were bringing to the tribe at that point. So I, I love that. Um, the word tribe, the, why do you use tribe instead of team? So one of the biggest desires we have in life is to belong. If you think of Maslow's hierarchy to self-actualization, the first two rungs of that are, do I have food and then am I going to be safe? And that's fine. But belonging, and if I think about, and we'll go back to my days in Australia, and I'll talk about rugby for a minute. So I played rugby when I was at high school. So I played on a team. And those were a group of people that got together and there was a starting time and a finishing time. There was a referee in the match and you were playing an opposite, opposite team and, you know, you, you got on and you either won or lost. The game ended, you know, you might go to the pub then and have a couple of pints and 
you may not get picked on that team again next week or not. You may be sidelined. And so although a team is there to, to play in, in a defined period with a very desired short-term outcome. So that's a team. And we have lots of teams within the company. Mm-hmm. Let's think about a tribe. The, the definition of Sebastian Jonger is a group of people who come together to protect and feed each other. So if we go back and look at human, the lifespan of, of the humans, it, it's, it's very tribal. We're tribal individuals. So I thought, wow, that's interesting. So I went and I, I, I studied the, uh, the indigenous Australians and the Fijian Islanders. And I thought, what was it that brought those people together? And what were the key elements of that, you know, years ago? And if we could get in a time warp and go back to my homeland thousands of years ago and observe a group of uh, Indigenous Australians at a kind of morning meeting, what would be happening? The tribal leader would be teaching the younger tribe members to throw a boomerang. Why? Because the boomerang was the tool of survival. So a tribe is a group of people that come together to protect and feed each other over a long period of time. And the number one responsibility of a tribal leader is to be a learner and a teacher. Because our job as learners and teachers is to help the tribe members that are coming along to build their competency and to you know, build their confidence. So that's the difference. A tribe is playing the infinite game. The number one responsibility of a tribe is to keep playing. The number one responsibility of a team is to win in a short period of time. Yeah, I love that. And it's, it's characteristic of the New Zealand All Blacks when you talk about, you know, Australian rugby and the wonderful book by James Kerr called Legacy. And there's Love so that much, book. yeah, I, it's, it's a book that I used to hand out to our leadership team. Uh, so much of it resonates with, with your own, uh, you know, your, your own teachings and what you write about. Uh, so it's, it's lovely to hear it in a corporate context. I really, I really enjoy that. And the the word coach then you used coach earlier in a conversation and, and, you know about five minutes earlier in the conversation why coach well if our job as leaders is to be learners and teachers the way you do that is to be a coach and unfortunately most managers feel they have to play the game so you manage your bank account and inventory our job is to coach people to play a better game And let's think about a great coach. Where is the coach? The coach is on the sideline, observing the play, understanding the game, and spending a lot of time in the locker room. A manager always wants to run on the field, micromanage and grab the ball. So the difference, there's a clear difference. The other thing is, I've never seen a great coach go to the podium and pick up the prize. However, the soul-sucking leader who wants to be a micromanager will always be there at the podium trying to pick up the prize instead of those that played the game. And you might know that I created this person called Al, the soul sucking CEO. (laughs) Um, And, you know, Al is someone who's corporate royalty. He must always be right. You know, he wants to take all the glory, all these things that are really about micromanagement, not about us And that's why our motto and what we wrote about in the book with Ken Blanchard is, is, I'm not here to mark your paper. I'm here to help you get an A. So what does an A look like? And what can I do as your coach to help you get there? Because if you get an A, I get an A. Yes, the character, Al, you're very scathing of of CEOs in the, in the first chapter of, of your book and kind of as, as personified by, by Al, the soul-sucking CEO. When you became CEO, Gary, back in 1997 versus now, you know, we're 2022, what, what have you learned along the way and you know now that you wish you knew back then? Um. The biggest learning I had was really getting comfortable with three words. I don't know. And um, I, I was reading, you know, some of the Dalai Lama, and I think I shared this with you, where he said our purpose in life is to make people happy. If we can't make them happy, please don't hurt them. And then I also was ex- exposed to some work of Marshall Goldsmith and 
you, you probably know Marshall and those that are with us today. You know, he's the number one executive coach in the world. And he wrote a great book called What Got You Here Won't Get You There, yeah. The 20 Habits of Poor Leadership. Uh, I admit I had all of those in some level of abundance at some time. And I, it's the awareness of those are not going to get you where you want to go. So, you know, I had to really think about it. And I have a little post-it note right in front of me on my, well, I have a lot of post-it notes in the back. See here, that. But, but I have a little post-it note right in front of me um, that I read all the time. And I'll share it with you. It says, am I being the person I want to be right now? And then I say, what or who is that person? And I, I say, I want to be caring. I want to be empathetic. I want to be a listener. I want to be fact-based. I want to be balanced. I want to be a curious leader and learner. And I want to throw sunshine, not a shadow. Now, the reason I have that here, it's a bit like that beautiful quote you shared with me earlier, um, which I took down at, at the end of the day, we are just walking, um, walking each, other each other home. Yeah. As we're walking home, we're walking down this, bumbling down this, you know, little pathway of life. Unfortunately, in the bushes are thieves and they will run onto that path and they'll pull us off that path of life we want to be in. And those thieves are things like jealousy and greed and, you know, ego. And unless we continually remind ourselves we don't want to be with them, then sometimes they suck us in. And we, we wake up one day and we say, how the hell did I get here? So for me, I have to continually remind myself that that's not who I want to be. Because sometimes I'll get sucked over there and I go, whoa, mm. you know, the old reptilian brain will come into yeah. to action and survival will be the most important thing and all that stuff that happens to us because we're complex human beings. But I don't want to be there. I really don't want to be there. And I had to make that decision many years ago that I don't want to be there. Now, when I normally introduce myself, I introduce myself this way. G'day, Brendan. I'm the consciously incompetent, probably wrong, and roughly right chairman and CEO of WD40 Company. And I don't think I would have had the guts to say that when I first became the CEO because I think I back then I think people would have felt lesser of me or I would have felt insecure. I'm completely comfortable with it now because I've learned that in most circumstances, I'm probably wrong and roughly right. And guess what? It's okay. And there, there's a lot in that. And our first principle of the, the 10 principle scale X model is psyche. And I always say to our CEOs, I mean, almost the other nine principles of scaling a business are futile in terms of understanding the mechanics of scaling a business. If you don't understand the mechanics of scaling your own mind and, and, beginning with self-leadership first lead self before you lead others before you lead an organization now given you you're prompting yourself every day and, I, and it's actually something i'm going to take away from this call uh, i love that 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 uh, you know persistent reminder of the person that you want to be and there's a level of humility there in terms of you acknowledging that those thieves will jump onto the path and we're all vulnerable to that at different points in time what do you do, Gary, you know, on a daily, weekly, monthly basis to manage your own mindset and to lead self? Um, be aware. Mm. It's really awareness. You know, I also have another principle called the daily questions where, uh, and I got that from Marshall Goldsmith, where I ask myself, did I do my best to, not did I do my best, but it's about the intention. Did I do my best to set goals? Did I do my best to achieve these goals? Did I do my best to walk my 10,000 steps? Did I do my best to call my kids? Did, you know, and I, I grade myself and I reflect on that, which is really important. But it's interesting you mentioned understanding yourself. In the master's degree I did, the first course that was a full week long was about understanding yourself. You know, we did the DISC model. We, we, we dove into what is culture all about? Where do you, you know, and it was like, wow. I, I, you know, I, I was a turbo D on the DISC model. Which is, <laughs> and, and a turbo D is be brief, be bright and be gone. And my professor said, you know what? You're not going to be a servant leader if you stay there. If I do the DISC model now, I'm an ID. And I intentionally went to the I side to be 
and, 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 and adopted those behaviors because I knew those behaviors, number one, would help me get people to where I want them to be. And number two, I really liked it better over there. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, in terms of, in terms of the practices that you find most impactful. So, you know, you've arrived at a point where you've connected with Marshall Goldsmith and I'm not sure when that occurred and kind of he's offered you the questions and, and I'm, you're journaling on that uh, on, a, on a daily basis. But uh, or if you to call out three practices that have been really profound in seeding that self-awareness Gary, what would the what would those be to kind of those CEOs of SMEs who well might might find that this is all a little bit abstract when they're caught in the bowels of the business at the moment, you know, call out for them what they can do to begin that journey of self awareness. Uh, I think number one is take time every day to center yourself. Right. You know, I, I'm a really early morning person, so I'm normally you know up at. 4.35 in the morning and I go to my home office and I center myself. Uh, I'm currently listening to a book by uh, T. Tuck Tum that just passed away. Um, uh, on, uh, and it's, a, it's the story of a, a Buddhist monk. Um, so I, I, I kind of try and center myself. Um, I, yeah, the next thing I do is I get very deliberate about what I will and won't do every day. And I, I want to do meaningful work. So I defined what meaningful work was to help me decide what I will and won't do. And for me, meaningful work is something that I believe will help others and that I want to do. So the reason I'm with you today is I'm privileged to share some of my scar tissue with you and others because I really want the world to be a happy place. And we as business people have the greatest opportunity to do that. And number two, we've proven at WD40, you can build a happy environment and at the same time be immensely successful as an organization that creates a, an economy within it that supports the people that you support, we support every day. So, you know, I think deliberate is, is really so centered, deliberate. And then, you know, these reminders that I have, whether it be this whole page of, of post-it notes behind me or this little one in front of me. And then finally, you know, as leaders, we get caught up. And I, I like to say, yeah, we need to ask ourselves these questions because it's hard being a leader. So it's, it's, did I do what I thought was right? Did I do my best? And if the answer to both of those is yes and yes, take a deep breath, make peace with it let it go because if you don't it's going to haunt you it's going to sit on your back mm. you know you you can't solve every problem in the world um but you know do what you think is best and do the right thing and then let it go yeah i love that and i and i have to share with the listeners whenever i'd reached out to you initially and you connected me to to holly who has been fantastic uh you signed off a lovely email uh, with a desire to support what we're doing here within Simple Scaling and, and through the Scale X Insider podcast with be well and let's do our best to make a positive difference in our world. And I thought that that's, that's class. That's just, a, that's just a little hint of class. So uh, it's, I, I, I love that. There's, there's a couple of things I want to come back to. And you mentioned the post-its. I thought that was related to the business. There's, I, I've just done a quick calculation on, the, on what's sitting behind you there there's 42 post-its are those reminders about how you should conduct yourself is that is that what those are yeah and the reminders about how i should conduct myself uh things that have pe people have said that have impacted me that i want to think about more um these are not um, you know goals ambitions or yeah. whatever they're all you know one one of them that I love on there is when we talked about uncertainty. You know, uncertainty is a series of future events that may or may not occur. Um, Rebecca, Dr. Rebecca Homkus shared that with me, and it's like, wow, that that's true. Um, you know, Brene Brown, in the absence of facts and data, we make up stories. Bang, that's so true. So sometimes I'll find myself turned around and just looking at that and reading it and going, yeah, that's right. I. That did, you know, that did make an impact on me. That was right. Um, so that's what they're for. Wow. Uh, it's incredibly impressive. 
And again, something I'll take away. You mentioned right at the outset when I posed the question about the three components or characteristics of your success in terms of moving from a company with a market cap of 300 million to, to now over 3 billion, which, which is incredible. 100 million revenue now to 500 million revenue on a tribe of uh, you know, 600 people with exporting to 176 countries, which is phenomenal. When you laid out your dream at the outset and you referred to it as a dream, uh, did you get a lot of rolled eyes? Here's the new guy coming. Uh, yeah, yeah, uh, we're going we're gonna to do all of this. And, um, you know, at that stage, you're 100 million, 80% of the revenue coming from North America. And secondly, how did you sell the dream and get the engagement? Yeah, you know, I love the quote of Nelson Mandela. It always seems impossible till it's done. Um, <laughs> um, yeah, I, I did, but I got more rolled eyes around my focus on building a culture of servant leadership. Um, you know, I remember, you know, in the early days when I was doing my master's degree and, and I was bringing all this back, you know, I, I'd, I'd go to school on Sunday and take it to work on Monday and, and everybody would say, you know, he's been drinking too much at Ken Blanchard's Kool-Aid. You know, <laughs> if we ignore him long enough, it'll go away. You know, um, so th I got more uh, rolled eyes about building the culture than I actually got about, you know, taking the brand to the world. Because I think we, we kind of sort of thought that was possible, a group of us that, you know, what was obvious to us that, you know, squeaks weren't um, unique to one geography and we'd already started to play around the world. So we saw that, but I, the rolling eyes was about, you know, this guy's crazy. I mean, what, what do you mean we have to have a set of values? What, what, what do you mean that we have to have a purpose statement? Well, why all this soft stuff? Let's just, you know, make, and it's interesting because as a public company, you know, you interact with Wall Street a lot and, Wall Street are very short-sighted. You know, it's what are you going to do for me for the next 90 days? Yeah. And I remember really early in my, my time as CEO, and here I was, this one-time traveling salesman from Australia that was now in the U.S., you know, leading a U.S. public company. And I'd never been to Wall Street. I didn't know. And um, I remember talking to, at that stage, a company, very well-respected investment company that had a, a reasonably, you know, significant stake in our company. And I remember saying to the to one of their leaders, look, I'm sorry. I'm not smart enough to be able to lead a company in 90 day intervals. And he said to me, I'm so glad you're not dumb enough to try. <laughs> and, and that actually gave me a lot of confidence because yeah. we wanted to play the infinite game. You know, I've yeah. always said, if you follow us quarter to quarter, you're going to jump off a cliff because we, we don't play a quarterly game. And it's interesting that it took a while for even the investment community to get used to that because sure, what you do in a quarter is important because it's like, it's a Lego block building the Lego castle. So, you know, if you have a quarter and there's a chip in the Lego block, you need to do something about that. Mm. But it doesn't mean that that Lego block is going to absolutely destroy the castle. So sure, you've got to take care of, you know, and, and be uh, attentive to what goes on. And then make sure you're doing something about it because you're going to add more blocks to build that castle. Yeah. So I think the, the eye rolling was more around the cultural side, Brendan, than, you know, and, and then we got started and we moved and there was a whole lot of stuff that went on. And when I look back at it, I go, wow, how did we get through that? But we did. It's because of the culture. And were there any signs that the, the, the culture seeds you were planting were starting to blossom you know was there a moment where you kind of you drove out of the car park and you felt yeah this is this is working one of the early things was the adoption of the learning moment and one of the things that became really clear to me is that fear was one of the most disabling emotions we have and I wanted to take the word failure out of the organization but I didn't want to take the word out and people not you know, realize that we are going to fail at some things. And in fact, you know, if you think about a, a great baseball player, he misses 700 balls out of a thousand. He only hits 300. And I also wanted to embed the, the a, a culture of learning. So I said, we're going to take the word failure out 
and we're going to replace it with learning moments. And we defined what a learning moment is. It's a positive or negative outcome of any situation that needs to be openly and freely shared to benefit all people. However, people were not really that forthcoming to want to share because their past experiences, not just in our company and in life was, I don't want to admit that I did something wrong. So I, I ran this contest for the first year. I said, okay, I'd, I want you to share with me on a monthly basis, a learning moment. And we had monthly prizes and the grand prize was going to be, you can, we're going to fly you and whoever it is, your partner, first class around the world to visit all of our offices. So, so in the first month, I got two or three and I made heroes of them. And in the second month, I got eight or 10 and I made heroes of them. And in the third month, I got 40 and I made heroes of them. And by the end, I was getting hundreds of these examples of learning moments. And that's when I was driving home one day and said, we've broken it. We've broken the fear barrier. There is a future. And, uh, and that was a great, and it took 12 months to get people to know that, yeah, okay, let's, let's hear it. We're not, we know we're going to, we're going to take in and not only that, we're going to take that learning moment and turn it into something positive into the future because we're going to share it. And, 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 and that's the basis of our learning culture. Wow. And, you know, for those just to, to be explicit, you know, you call mistakes, you know, learning moments there's no such thing as a mistake or failure in the in, in the business it's a it's a learning moment and again that speaks to i suppose my own philosophy or uh, creating a win or learn culture not win or lose how did you address or how do you address then the you know coming back to care candor accountability responsibility uh in relation to the kind of the principles and values that you want to see upheld within your people. How do you address, you know, the learning moment and the potential of somebody to continue to do the same thing over again uh, with, yeah. ac with accountability? You know, at what point do you say, no, no, hold on here now. You know, we've already learned that. Uh, we've invested heavily in it. And there was a cost attached in, in the investment of that learning moment, but we shouldn't be replicating it again. How do you address that? Well, the second you know, pillar of candor is no lying, no faking, no hiding. Right. So, um, you know, I have an algorithm for culture. Culture equals parentheses, values plus behavior, close parentheses, times consistency. So if we think about, and I'll give you, you know, an example. So um, Joe uh, has a job where he needs to come to work and be there at nine o'clock every morning and he's late every day. So you go to Joe and you say, hey, Joe, your learning moment is you're late every day. That's not going to work out. You know, our second value is to create positive lasting memories. You're in a customer service. You need to be there at a certain time to, you know, to serve our customers. And you say, yeah, I know, but I but I have trouble getting up every morning. I said, well, I'm your coach. I'm not here to mark your paper. I'm here to help you get an A. How about I buy you an alarm clock? Yeah, okay. So I buy Joe an alarm clock and Joe set this alarm clock and when it goes off, get up and come to work. Well, I buy him the alarm clock and you know, Joe still comes to work late. And so he's second let Joe, what's the deal here, man? Well, yeah, it does go off, but I hit the snooze button. Joe, that's not the way to work. You know, it's not going to work. Okay, here's what I'm going to do, Joe. I'm going to call you every morning at 7 o'clock personally. I'm going to do it for 20 days. At the end, it doesn't work. So the, the conversation with Joe is, Joe, you know, these are not learning moments. These are habits that you're not going to change. And obviously, you know, it's not working for you. I want you to be happy. You're not happy here because you have to come to work early. You're not, obviously, you're not a morning person. You know, do we have a job that will let you go later? If not, no. Okay, how can we help you go to your next place to be happy? So there's, there's an acceptable learning moment, which is one that happens during, you know, uh, innovation, curiosity, experimentation. And there's an unacceptable one, which is one that is repeated by someone with a high level of competency in that particular skill. Mm -hmm. And those, that learning moment is not a learning moment. Yeah. It's where you, you know, you have to be, no lying, no faking, no hiding. Joe, I'm not going to lie to you. I'm not going to fake to you. I'm not going to hide to you. You're not meeting that. And we decided that's what we had to do. So we have to you know, find a way around this. 
but the values gives everybody the the guidelines by which they should behave and act and it also gives the coaches the language to be right. candid with the tribe members so yeah I, re- yeah I really like that um just moving on to to partnerships and given the tribe mentality uh how has COVID been for you guys uh, generally? And then I'm, I'm making the assumption here, given that everyone was at uh, home for, for, for quite a period, people took a vested interest in their, in their homes and that rusty, rusty hinge on the garden gate. And, and I suspect you guys have done incredibly well, but uh, maybe you can share with us how you have done. But importantly, I'd like to kind of uh, address the again, one of our principles, which is partnerships. And the, the, the tribe culture, does that extend to all stakeholders? Do, does that extend into your supply chain and uh, the culture expectation within your supply chain? And how have you managed the supply chain throughout uh, COVID, Gary, if you could speak to that? Okay, there's a few questions there. So let me try and unpack a couple of them. Firstly, as far as the company's concerned, We just finished our fiscal year in August. We're in August fiscal year. We had the best year in the company's history. Um, And a lot of it is, there's a few reasons. Number one, you you kind of alluded to it. We called it isolation renovation. (laughs) Um, You know, that that squeaky hinge that you heard twice a day, you're now hearing 40 times a day, and it wasn't creating a positive lasting memory for you when your wife partner or significant other kept telling you that damn squeak is getting on my so you went and you went and fixed the squeak and now you were a hero to your wife partner or significant other and that was the positive lasting memory so that happened uh the other thing that was very positive for us is we'd made some substantial investments many years ago into e-commerce so we were very very well positioned to be able to not only communicate with our end users in a in a in, in a new and wide way all around the world uh, but to also when supply chain or distribution channels shut down, um, they were able to get our product through alternative distribution channels like e-commerce. Uh, so that was great. And then, of course, the most powerful thing was our tribe. Um, you know, we did a, a check-in employee engagement survey halfway through COVID uh, just to see if we were draining what I call cultural equity because we were deliberate from day one that we weren't going to let our cultural equity drain. So we were doing a lot of different things. Um, We became very competent at being virtual. You know, I've often said in the face of real and great need, people can pivot around fear. And we had real and great need. And there was a lot of fear in, hey, we had all this this technology to be virtual, but people weren't really using it because they were afraid. And then in March, 2020, it became compulsory and we had to get used to it. So we set people up to not fail, but to realize we're gonna be vulnerable in this thing. You know, I I purposely screw up in meetings that were virtual to show people that, you know what? Sorry, Max, my wonder dog just walked in, you know, like (laughs) nothing I can do about it. Um, So, you know, the culture was was absolutely key. And in that, here's an interesting piece of data. In that survey, there was one number that went up that surprised me. It was the question of 98% of our tribe globally said, I am excited about the company's future. Now, let me tell you when that was. That was in January of 2021, bang in the middle of COVID. So we went out and said, why? Why why did that go to 98%? And here's what we heard. As a tribe who kept its promise, as a group of people that come together to protect and feed each other, if we can get through this together, nothing will ever stop us. I'm excited about the company's future. So I was pretty happy about that. Um, and it, it again goes back to the power of caring and and it was hard. I mean, I, I, look, be under no misunderstanding. I am really, uh, I, I really have emotion about what COVID has done. You know, it's hurt a lot of people, people have died. On the other flip side of that coin, my goodness, we have learned so much. We've pivoted and learned so much about what's important to us in life. And that's why this great, what they're calling the great resignation now, I'm calling the great escape. Mm-hmm. People are saying, 
I'm going to get out of toxic cultures. I'm not putting up with this anymore. Mm -hmm. You know, I could put up with going to work and, and being in that culture I didn't like because normal life was kind of normal. But now normal life is not normal anymore. So I've got to deal with not normal life. And you expect me to go to work and put up with all this toxic crap, excuse me. And they're saying, I'm not going to put up with it anymore. In fact, interestingly enough, um, uh, the letter from um, BlackRock's CEO just came out this week. And he says in his opening paragraph, basically, organizations who realized that they took care of their people are the ones that are being rewarded during COVID. So, you know, get a slap up the side of the face. And, you know, it's about time we started building cultures where people actually lived to what Aristotle said, which is pleasure in the job puts perfection in the work. Yeah, I, I, I love that. And, uh, you know, I, I would say it's, it's the great era of consciousness. People have the time now to reflect on why they're doing what they're doing and really consider the the company and the the purpose and the alignment to the values uh, because they've had that time at home they've had the time with their family with their with their children um, and uh, as you rightly say those good companies who have looked after their people throughout this have been rewarded in terms of your supply chain then sorry which was the second bit of that question oh, sorry. How, yep. Because, I mean, a lot of the companies that I'd be dealing with and uh, the CEOs that I'm speaking with have been really challenged with their supply chain and, and lead times. Have you guys, uh, you know, subject, suffered the same sort of challenges? And, and how do you cultivate that, that tried mentality amongst your supply chain? Yeah, certainly. I think the two biggest um, headwinds we had and probably still have uh, um, supply chain and inflation. Um, there is no doubt that both of those are rampant. Well, inflation is just crazy. Um, I don't think the world has yet realized, you know, what the impact of that is because it's still coming. You know, as far as the supply chain's concerned, it, it was different in different geographies. And it wasn't about culture. It's about what happened. For example, in the United States, you know, have people have big houses, they have big pantries, they can buy a lot of stuff and put it in. So they bought a lot of toilet paper and paper towels and they sucked up all of those. But in the business we're in, which is in the aerosol business, they also bought a lot of spray disinfectants and everything else. So there was a huge demand on aerosol filling capacity. And at the same time, you know, that demand was moving up the supply chain to you know, the raw materials that go with that. So um, there was a lot of rationing going on, um, and you know, yes, that that did impact us. Uh, it subsided a little bit. It's caused us to make some different decisions about the amount of um, uh, concentration we have at, at certain packages and whatever. So it's taken us a while to recover from that. Uh, less, to, less so in, in in Europe and Asia. Um, they didn't have the same uh, pressures, but then in in Europe. You know, you had things happen to you, like the unintended consequences of Brexit, where all of the lorry drivers that were there on visas went back to their countries, so now they had no one to drive lorries. Um, the unexpected circumstances of the, the, the shortage of container ships and, and containers, you know, and then someone puts a, 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 a ship the wrong way in the Suez Canal and everything gets all clogged up, you know. So it, it's been a time of, you know, whack-a-mole you know what's coming next um but you know we've had to be resilient and we'd have to we had to change so yeah supply chain and but i to answer your question i don't think it was more about culture or tribalism or values uh it was a lot about circumstance and what's been the big learning moment for you in all of this um culture is a competitive advantage I want to be respectful of your time. I mean, there's there's so much. Uh, there's just so, there's there's so much in all of this. Uh, hopefully, we'll get you back for a part two, Gary. You've uh, you know you're you're just a a real font of of knowledge, wisdom, experience, great insight, uh, and a and a and a wonderfully lived life. Um, in terms of 
timeless takeaways. Now, let me just ask you one, one other question because I, I referred to it, if, if you will indulge me, I referred to it right at the outset, your wonderful book. And you have a chapter at the end of this book and you call out your talent partner, your CHRO, and you almost dedicate the chapter to the book. Uh, and I recommend your book, Tribe Culture, How It Shaped WD40 Company. We'll put a link to this in our, in our show notes. I recommend it to our listeners. I love the way you describe your relationship with your CHRO. If you can just share with the listeners how important you feel that relationship is and what CEOs should do to cultivate that relationship. Well, you know, again, because we think and we believe that culture is a competitive advantage, you know, the CHRO needs to be at the table and needs to be there at the leadership table. And, you know, they need to be a counter, a balance, a confident, uh, someone who's who's not afraid to, you know, really be that balance in decision making. Uh, and I was fortunate enough to, to work with Stan, the person that I, I um, talk about in that book um, for many years. And uh, it was a truly, he's just since retired. We now have a great new CHRO who's been with us for a, quite a time anyhow. But, you know, it, it is, don't leave that person out. Bring that person to the table because if you, you know, they, and the other thing that's great about a great CHRO is they need to understand the commercial side of the business because it's, it's the commercial side of the business that they're going to help you develop over time. So um, there are many great things about that relationship that were very special to me. And um, I'm very grateful that I, again, um, had someone to, a lot smarter than me. Yeah. <laughs> well, it, again, it was a penny dropping moment for me. I listened to uh, uh, what the, the, very famous Jack Welch speak at an IOD conference some years ago, and that's the penny dropping moment for me. Uh, I'll, uh, I've shared it before on the podcast, and when he polled to the audience of a couple of thousand people, the how people thought, uh, uh, what, what people thought about uh, the, the most important asset in their business, uh, and is it people? And everybody put up their hands, and I, through a series of questions, actually ended up asking how many. Well, given that. People feel that talent is the most important component or enabler to the success of their business. How many people have a talent director on the boardroom? And I think three hands remained after, after a couple of thousand. And that was the penny dropping moment for me. Of course, this is so obvious. You know, people's the most important enabler to a business. The person who is going to be dedicated to enabling, uh, attracting, building, moving great people within your business should be at the boardroom table to understand the vision of the business, to understand the plan in terms of how to execute in our vision and to help us get the right people um, in place to deliver. So, but yeah. Amen on that. Amen <laughs> on that. So, so there you go. In closing, Gary, I always pose to our guests three timeless takeaways. As I've uh, referred, you've lived uh, an, an amazing life, uh, uh, wonderful experiences, met some incredible people. What three timeless takeaways would you share with our listeners if you could only, if you could only impart three things? Um, as leaders, it's not about you. It's about the people you lead. Uh, life is a gift. Don't send it back unwrapped. Get unwrapping it uh, pretty quickly. And, um, you know, get comfortable with those three words. I don't know and be proud of it. Brilliant. Gary, it's been uh, a real, a real honor to speak with you today. I've, I've loved uh, every moment of it. The time has flown. And uh, just in terms of, people connecting with you. I know you're very generous with your, with your time. You have your own website. If you, you know, if people want to reach you, where best to, to connect with you, Gary? Yeah. LinkedIn is, you know, I, I, I use LinkedIn a lot to, to share some of my scar tissue. So you'll find me at LinkedIn. And then my website is www.thelearningmoment.net. And on there, I, um, I share again, some blog stuff and uh, books that I like and, all right. So those are probably the two best places. Brilliant. Well, Gary, look, I wish you uh, continued success in everything you're doing. Uh, continue being wonderful and, uh, and, and, and bringing wonderful memories to the world. Take care. Thank you, sir.